Welcome back. Uh, about a decade ago, the then Deputy Prime Minister, Julie Gillard, gave an important address at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And she made the declaration that Australia's financial sector uh, was the envy of the world. And she was right. And this was indeed the accepted wisdom uh, in the political, um, business and media world in this country. And uh, this was justified on several grounds. I mean, Australia had weathered the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98. We weathered the US tech wreck in 2000-2001. And of course, we weathered the global financial storm uh, in 2007-2008-2009. And uh, when Julia Gillard as Prime Minister from 2010 to 2013, she continued to make these boasts on the international scene our banks had negligible direct exposure to the European sovereign debt. Our banking sector was among the world's safest for investors. Indeed, the strength of the Australian financial sector was a direct result of a sensible balance between market forces and prudential regulation in this country, uh, policies that had bipartisan support whether it be under Treasurer Paul Keating or Treasurer Peter Costello. However, uh, during the course of recent years, our banking sector's reputation has been tarnished, and uh, this was obviously demonstrated clearly by the Hain Royal Commission, which was commissioned by Prime Minister Turnbull in late 2017 and was revealed a few months ago. So the questions here today are, are the banking scandals the fault of market forces the deregulation of the financial services? How has the industry responded to the revelations of the Royal Commission? And how do policymakers and regulators balance restoring trust in our financial sector with maintaining the flow of credit? Well, we have a terrific discussion and I'll introduce both of our speakers one at a time. Uh, Anna Bly is the Chief Executive of the Australian Banking Association just down the road. Uh, prior to her role in banking, Anna had a very distinguished career in state politics in Queensland. Uh, she was the Premier of the great state of Queensland from uh, 2007 to 2012, so five years. Um, please welcome Anna Bly. Thank you, Anna. And uh, Simon Cowan is my colleague here at the Centre for Independent Studies. He is the research director here. Uh, many of you have no doubt seen Simon perform on television and radio, most notably Sky News and the public broadcaster, the ABC. He's presently working on a major field of study on the future of work. It's examining Australia's worker class and whether they will be left behind, as indeed many parts of the working class have been left behind in the United States and Britain. Please welcome Simon Cowan. <laughs> Over to you, Simon. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Anna. Um, we're going to jump right in. I mean, I think Tom might have picked the high point in history for uh, the relationship between the public and the banking sector. I don't think that historically people have been that fond of banks or bankers. Um, and I think it's fair to say the Banking Royal Commission probably displayed evidence of serious and systemic wrongdoing on the part of the banks and the financial services sector. But having said that, <coughs> surely the banking sector is relieved at the Hale and Royal Commission report. I mean, there's no major structural changes, no huge compliance regime, fears that access to finance have probably substantially diminished. Alan Fells. You know, the great regulator, Alan Fells, called it a damp squib. What were your impressions of the report? And do you think the Royal Commission has been justified in the end? Uh, I think we've got some bankers in the room. Um, if there is one at your table, uh, <laughs> turn to them, because I don't think there'd be one of them uh, who lived through the last 12 months who would describe the experience as a damp squib. I think every one of them would say they felt quite excoriated by the end of it. Uh, it was an incredible, um, incredibly gruelling experience. I've had a bit to do with Royal Commissions. I've called them. I've given evidence to them. Uh, and I've never seen one that um, was, well, he was given a relatively short period of time, one year, very big terms of reference. And he, from day one, was determined to meet that deadline. And that meant uh, a pace um, that was gruelling. 
And uh, what you saw on the public hearings was really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so the commission um, conducted himself by you know, literally every couple of days issuing notices to produce documents uh, to every bank and financial institution. Uh, largely, and I don't say this in a bad way, you know, basically a big fishing exercise to refine down what are the case studies, what are the areas he needs to look at. And so from, peop from the point of view of people working in banks, um, whether it was here in head office or out in the Dubbo branch, uh, there were masses of documents being um, collated. Uh, you know, quite junior staff were having every email you know, put together, seen by lawyers, people living and waiting for two, three, four weeks. Is it my case study that's going to be on the stand? Am I going to have to be giving evidence? So those things are, you know, take their toll, I think, in big organisations. Um, was it justified? Uh, I think I have strong views about when <laughs> Royal Commission should be called. Um, and I think there's sort of very strong public policy reasons, you know, when the normal um, uh, criminal justice system um, of the state fails uh, or someone like the, one of the arms of the judiciary or, or the um, enforcement, such as the police, are the subject of it. Because they're very extraordinary powers that really do... Um, undermine the rights of citizens and they should be used sparingly. But there are always cases, and this was one of them, where something in the political arena gets such a head of steam that it becomes impossible to address um, in a way that is careful and thoughtful. And, uh, you know, the, the debate just gets to a sort of fever pitch where you need something that is going to sort of lance or burst that bubble, lance that boil. Now, it doesn't always have to be a royal commission, but there have certainly been... Uh, this was an example, I think, of where a royal commission uh, actually burst all of that and allowed the public to uh, to see things and allowed banks, I think, to see their behaviour in a very different light. And so in that sense, I think it did have that effect. I think that has actually been important. Talking at my table and saying, I, I you know, imagine if we had got to this position, we had a re-elected government, new prime minister... Um, you know, Scott Morrison's there, Josh Frydenberg's there, and we've still got um, the opposition, the Greens and the National Party calling for a Royal Commission into banks. I mean, we're, it's so much better to be where we are now with recommendations to implement, an opportunity to rebuild trust, an opportunity to restore reputation, uh, as opposed to being constantly the subject of a bank bashing agenda. Mm. And I mean, trust, I think, is probably one of the, the big issues that the one of the biggest issues revealed by the Royal Commission is the issue of fees for no services. Um, and I think, you know, if you read the report, Hain talks a lot about the idea of a culture of profit above all else, a, a culture of profit above trust, really. Um, how has the industry responded to that challenge in, in the short term? And, and where do you think the response is headed from here? Uh, yes, the, the Commission... The fees for no service, I think, is an interesting case in point. Uh, this was a matter that had been examined quite thoroughly by ASIC. ASIC had actually gone into a number of banks and, uh, and to financial advice um, organisations and delved right into their books and right into people's um, accounts. They had identified this. They had issued and published a public report on it. Uh, this report had been picked up and published in newspapers but it was the financial review and the business pages of The Australian. This was not something that made the television news. It wasn't the subject of radio. So for the broader public, these exposés in the Royal Commission felt like a very big revelation. Um, as I said, it, it really goes to that, the function of a Royal Commission to shine sunlight as a disinfectant, if you like. It's very hard, I think, in the day-to-day -day business of regulators um, and even the way regulator work is reported and where it's reported, for the public to really see into that and have a line of sight. So once the public saw all of that, uh, yes, a very significant um, or a further breach of um, trust. Banks are not the only institutions that are suffering a significant erosion in trust. Uh, some of what they're experiencing is absolutely about their own behaviour. Some of it, I think, is more broadly a loss of faith and a loss of trust in institutions more generally, media, the institutions of our democracy, uh, you know, even in other institutions that have always been a bedrock like the church. So institutions generally, and banks are big institutions, having a problem with trust. 
uh, and we have to work to rebuild it. Um, if I had one magic bullet that would do that, Simon, I'd be firing that bullet right now. <laughs> but the reality is when you lose someone's trust, it's not that different, I think, when whether it's a big institution or, you know, you have a falling out cause of, with a friend who betrays you in some way, betrays a confidence, and you think, I can't trust them per that person again. The only way you come to trust that person again is they repeatedly and reliably and consistently behave in a different way. And there's no shortcuts on that. You know, you're not going to trust them the first time. You're going to wait to see if they do it the next time and the next time, and then you'll start to feel, actually, I can trust this. So um, I always say banks, if you've, the only way to behave or the only way out of a problem that you behaved yourself or you behaved your way into is to behave your way out of it. So banks are right now preparing for the implementation of a brand new code of um, banking practice that starts on the 1st of July. There are a number of recommendations of the Royal Commission that go directly to you know, conduct and culture, which banks have to implement, and they're in the process of doing that. There was a number of recommendations that government have to um, implement that will change the rules and make them fairer and more consistent and more transparent, not only in banks, but across the financial services sector. Uh, all of those things together, that will put the, a, you know, a different framework in there, but every single day, the, the leadership challenge for those people who are running Australia's banks is to drive a culture of reliability, consistency, <coughs> fairness and transparency. Um, you know, you'd have the best legal framework, which I actually think we do in this country. Um, as the commissioner himself kept saying, the behaviour that I am seeing here is already illegal. Uh, it's actually about a culture of not just compliance. I think if that's what we come out of this with, that will be a poor outcome for customers. If they're just being, you know, yes, I've ticked that box, I've ticked that box, I gave you the terms and conditions. It's actually, did I think about what you really needed? Did you get the best product for you? And, and the whole attitude, I think, to customer outcomes. Mm. And, and I mean, obviously banks have copped a lot of heat over this, but I think there's probably at least two other elements here that, that came out of the Royal Commission that, that are worth exploring. The first is, is ASIC. There was, I think, perhaps a rightful level of criticism placed in ASIC and their enforcement activities. I mean, the response to every criticism of any regulator that I've ever seen is, well, we need more funding. But I think it's clear from some of the activities <laughs> that it's not an issue of funding, it's an issue of culture in ASIC as well. Do you think the regulator got off too lightly out of the report? Uh, well, again, I don't think if you, that ASIC, anyone at ASIC feels like they got off lightly um, or at APRA. I mean, I think there was a, that's probably the most scrutiny those two um, regulators have ever had. And it's probably the, the first time that the public has really had an opportunity to look at how they do their work. I think the supervisory model is a hard one protect, to sort of explain publicly. I think when the public hears regulator, they think they need to be the police. And certainly there's an element of that. But the sort of supervisory regulatory um, approach that particularly we've had in our prudential um, area, I think is one of Australia's strengths um, and we need to be careful of protecting that. But look, ASIC itself has already said, as a result of the Royal Commission, I mean, they had their own sunlight and their own, I, you know, I think what we saw was regulators who were in the public's mind and I think, in, and the Commission's view, taking too long to reach conclusions taking too long to do investigations and giving the industry too many opportunities um, you know to yeah to take too long and to not get on with fixing things fast enough. Uh, ASIC's been very clear they have changed their posture that's the language they use uh, and that they will be leaning in uh, much more to the enforcement uh, part of their activity. Were they too close to the the banks and their the people that they were supposed to be regulating? I think that's a that's a hard question to answer. As I said, I think there's an element that, of work that requires some level of closeness. Uh, you know, you want an environment where a bank or an insurance company can actually go to the regulator and said, you know, I've identified this happening uh, in my business. Um, it's happening for these reasons. I'm not sure if it crosses the line or would this be a better way to do it? I think you want to be able to have those conversations, not just wait for a bank or a finance uh, institution to get it really wrong and then come in and 
wallop them. So you do want some level of relationship um, as appropriate, um, but that can be a blurry line. And I think there was some evidence at the Royal Commission that perhaps that line had been crossed um, in too many, um, too many times, not only by the regulator, but by the regulated, an expectation that there would always be negotiated outcomes. And I think we all know that sometimes um, you know, there needs to be outcomes uh, you know, in the right circumstances where enforcement um, takes precedence. The other half of this, and one of the things that I think worried me a lot coming out of the Royal Commission was the the fact that a lot of stories simply of investments that went wrong and banks enforcing their terms were put alongside the idea that banks were functionally stealing from their clients. I mean, one story that got a lot of prominence was an older woman who had mortgaged her house to provide a guarantee for her, her daughter's business. The business failed, the bank wanted to, to take advantage of the, the guarantee. Um, that, to me, is simply a, an example of, of the sort of financial transaction that everyone would expect to be able to undertake. I mean, to, to say, no, you're not allowed to help your kids start a business, you're not allowed to, to, to do this, because we, the financier, know better than you do about this. To, to what extent are we at risk of losing expectations of diligence for, for customers in this space? Well, we have traditionally relied on a system of buyer beware. And I think I, like you, worry that uh, sometimes in the public debate on this and the political debate, uh, we've shifted almost to vendor beware. And I think that would be a very poor outcome for, uh, for customers. I think it's poor outcome for the economy and a very poor outcome for access to credit. Uh, the Commissioner himself commented uh, on a number of occasions, both um, in the transcript and in his reports, uh, along the lines that um, it is often very hard, particularly in a business um, loan, it is very hard for the business borrower to accept that the failure of their business may be um, largely related to their um, business decisions and lack of business acumen. That there is a group of businesses who, and particularly small businesses, I mean, you know, people put their dreams into this. People have, um, you know, that they've got a a very strong attachment. It's not like turning up at work and getting your paycheck. There's a personal investment and attachment to a business that someone has always wanted to start. And so if it fails or begins to fail, uh, and the commissioner again commented on this, people take the view that the bank, um, that the whole thing failed because the bank, um, if they just let them go another month, it would have turned around. If they'd just given them another six months, they could have turned that business around. It's very hard, I think, to succeed in small business unless you have that kind of belief. Um, but that kind of belief can often mean that you can't face that, in fact, the business was never going to work on that particular corner. So, yes, I do think we've got to be very cautious. If all the responsibility for making that decision rests with the bank, who, frankly, are, are never going to be in a position where they will have expertise on every possible business that they might be lending to, then they will be exceptionally cautious in who they lend to and how they lend. And, and I think there is an element in the commentary that hasn't taken sufficient account of that. So, I mean, I think you said very, at the very beginning, you know, there hasn't been a significant drop off in credit. It's, if you actually go and look at the data, it's business lending. Um, there, is, there is strong growth in business lending, but it is almost all of it at the top end. Uh, so there has been a decline in borrowings sorry, lending um, from the naught to 100,000 and 100,000 to 500,000. That is, um, the decline is now in both of those categories in double digits um, in the last uh, six to 12 months. Um, housing, there is still growth in the housing market, uh, but it is, but the rate of growth is the lowest in the 42 years that they have been recording this data. So there is something happening there. Um, and I'm not saying it's all Royal Commission, some of it's, I think, also demand side. But I don't think that we should think that there's been no consequences. And not surprisingly, of course, as some of us predicted during the Royal Commission, the people who are most impacted by that tightening of credit, it's not wealthy people, it's not big businesses, it's marginal borrowers, particularly marginal personal borrowers, and small businesses. And that's exactly the kind of impact you would expect from this and what we were concerned about, right? Um, 
Exactly. Uh, you know, I think biz banks are in the business of managing risk, assessing and managing risk. And, uh, you know, the Governor of the Reserve Bank has said on a couple of occasions, you know, we do not want a banking system that doesn't take risk. Uh, that would be a terrible outcome. Um, we also don't want um, a, a business community that doesn't take risks. We want to encourage those people who really want to start a business um, and, and have got, you know, some have got a good idea and got, um, you know, uh, something that might work. You want people to be prepared to have a go and take a risk. But sometimes the nature of risk is it doesn't work out. And we've got to be careful, I think, about where we assign the blame for that. Um, sometimes it will be that the bank maybe didn't make the right decision, but it won't always be that. And uh, I think we've got to be very careful. The more that banks are required to take less, well, the more that banks are constrained from taking risk, and the more that the um, any you know the regulatory um, architecture restricts them and make you know there's a flight to kind of safety and almost no risk, then you know we we're going to be in a bad position. Mm. And I mean, blame is an interesting word that you use there because one of the things I think w that feeds through strongly on a, on a certain line of criticism of banks is that this is a failure of capitalism. It's a failure of markets. I mean, in the US in particular, in response to 2009, we saw a lot of op-eds saying that, you know, the deregulation of financial services is a failure and a disaster. But do you think this is actually reflecting poorly on capitalism? Well, it was interesting. I don't recall his exact words, but when Prime Minister Turnbull announced that there was going to be a Royal Commission... He said something to the effect of this is an examination of our financial system. It is not an inquiry into capitalism. And, but nevertheless, the Commission did actually go to the question of how markets operate and how, um, you know, what obligation businesses might have to their shareholders versus their customers yeah. uh, and other potential stakeholders, the broader community. And well, and one of the bankers rather famously said that the reason why all this went wrong was, was capitalism while he was in the chair. <laughs> um, I, did, I do think, not only in banking, but I do think that some of the deliberations of the Hain Royal Commission have rippled across corporate Australia. And I think there would be very few top um, you know, 200 boards that are not having conversations about uh, the balance around stakeholder, sorry, shareholder, interest and customer interest and and how you... I, mean, I actually think it's a false dichotomy. I think it's very hard to deliver good long-term shareholder value um, in an environment where you're not treating your customers right. And I think most people, a lot of nods around the room. But nevertheless, every, you know, every six months, a listed company has to go out and tell a story to their shareholders that's going to encourage their shareholders to keep holding their stock. And getting that short-term, long-term balance is a challenge for any good company and I think the Rahane Royal Commission have given boards um, cause to just stop and think, are we getting that balance right? Because look at the reputational damage that can happen if we don't get that right. Because, um, you know, the, while there has been, there was a lot of commentary about the, um, the market, um, you know, bank shares bounced on the day of the, you know, bounced up on the day the Royal Commission report came down, which is kind of not surprising. Market, I think, always prices in the worst case scenario. And when it doesn't occur, you know, they bounce up. But, it, but if you go and have a look at where bank shares were, um, you know, two years ago and where they are now, there's still a lot of shareholder value that's been destroyed by that reputational damage. And it's a long climb back. Yes. And so, I mean, the media attention largely disappeared off the Hain Royal Commission as a result of the election. Um, the, but your sense is that this is still resonating in corporate Australia, even if the... the spotlight of the media has disappeared? I mean, now that the election's over, does it come back to political and media focus or does it just stay in the business community? Well, I think it's going to be interesting. It's not only the Royal Commission. Remember the, uh, the report that APRA did into the Commonwealth Bank, um, into culture. Uh, that's been sent to, uh, you know, APRA sent that to uh, a very large um, distribution list of companies and said some of them, they actually required them to do a self-assessment against it. Others, they said, we think you should do this. And I think... Um, so there's a lot of things coming together at once. Uh, interestingly, I, you know, I'll be honest, um, we forecast at the beginning of the year that uh, banks were likely to feature quite heavily uh, in the federal election campaign. Uh, while they did feature in some of the Labor Party's advertising, um, neither side actually made any new commitments. Or So our concern was that there would be a bidding war. 
that Hain would be seen as the foundation and we'll all just bid on top of that. So yes, there's a certainly relief that <coughs> that didn't happen. In fact, of the three debates, the word bank was only mentioned um, once. Um, and Anthony, that was in relation to the Reserve Bank of Australia. So um, <laughs> We'll get to them in a second, <laughs> I think, it's fair um, to say. But it's just interesting, you know, I think there was a lot of commentary that this would be an, a, uh, an election that had a lot of... Um, a lot about banks and boats, and in fact, neither of them featured um, it to any real extent. And it's not unusual for an election campaign to end up being about something quite different at the end than it started out. And I think you saw a lot of that this time around. So, yes, not a lot coming out in the election. Uh, we've now got the government and new ministers uh, and new shadow ministers all, you know, finding their way and putting their feet under the desk. But they, I think, will very quickly turn their attention to making sure that they are um, well ahead on implementing the Royal Commission recommendations. Uh, so that will be a very busy time in banks, working with the government to get all of that right. To the extent, the extent to which that is on the front page is yet to be seen, but I suspect uh, we won't see a lot of that, mm. um, making it into anywhere other than perhaps the financial review and, and you know, the Australian business, you know, the business um, media, because there's some very big public policy issues that the government will have to grapple with. Some of the recommendations seem pretty straightforward, but when you actually delve into them, there's some big things at stake in getting it right. Uh, but I don't think that will necessarily play out that way. Um, there are other things that can affect reputation. Um, I ask you to cast your mind back about seven days. Um, you know, there are tough decisions business banks are making uh, for commercial reasons that will have impact on people's view of, of them. Uh, but it's a low, long, slow climb um, you know, reputation um, arrives on a tortoise and leaves on a galloping horse. Mm. Uh, so I think everybody's back into tortoise phase. Yeah. I mean, not not that any, things are going very quickly in banks. People are working, you know, overtime to do all of this, but actually the reputation will follow at a slower pace. And, and I suppose it's probably worth talking about the the response to rate cuts. I mean, one of the things that is consistent in, in debates about banks is heat on them for not passing on the full cuts Versus particularly the expectation that any rate rises go the same day. Um, what do you make of the, the response post Hain? And, and I think particularly this time with the intervention of the Governor of the Reserve Bank saying that he thought that the full rate should be passed on. Uh, obviously, this, is, this affects every bank, but it is um, in the public arena largely the four majors that are the subject of um, attention. Uh, obviously, each one of those banks have to make their own commercial decision, and I'm not in a position to, and nor should I be, to know what the commercial um, matters that they took into account. I think all I'd want to say on this is, I think we've got four, um, four very strong CEOs who absolutely are committed to working to restore trust and build the reputation of their organisation. Um, you don't become the CEO of a major bank without being you know, someone who is very bright, someone very committed and high achieving and wanting to get results. Uh, and I think every one of them would have known that there was a kind of easy, simple thing to have done last week um, in terms of reputation. If they chose for whatever reason commercially not to, um, then maybe that's worth reflecting on. <laughs> that maybe there are other things that we don't, that, there are, that are at play. Um, uh, there are going to be further, um, you know, first Tuesdays of the month, between now and the end of the year, I, I'm not in a position to know what the Reserve Bank will do, but there's plenty of um, expectation that this may not be the last cut this year. Uh, we're getting down to, you know, very low levels. Um, you know, the levers on monetary policy are getting tighter and tighter. And, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be some tough decisions ahead for banks. One of the interesting things I thought last week, and it's the first time that I can remember this being such an explicit part of the conversation, is a recognition that there are winners and losers when there is a rate cut and that um, the group of losers, this, uh, you know, that is savers and depositors, um, are probably a very high number of them uh, were taking into account their financial arrangements in how they cast their vote at, you know, at the recent election. So I think there's be interesting to see how that plays out mm. in subsequent discussions. Um, so one more question from me, then I'll turn it over to, to you guys. Um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the election, but I think it's it's worth. But you can't help yourself. Sam. I know I can't help myself, <laughs> and we all want to we all want to know. 
Um, rather than your view on the result, though, I think the surprise re-election of the government potentially um, puts the Royal Commission response and, you know, who's leading it and the, the sort of group of voters who supported the government, I think that's probably different from what people expected it to be in April. Um, you know, what do you think, gazing into the crystal ball, what do you think the response will be? Where do things go from here? Um, you know, for example, something out of left field, but do you think that with the re-election of the government, corporate tax cuts come back onto the agenda? Well, I'll answer the first part of the question and then come back to that one. Um, uh, well, from, a, from the perspective of banks, and I, I, is, we've got a Prime Minister who is a former Treasurer, and while he was Treasurer, it, it was at the time when the issue of banks was at fever pitch. Uh, so you have in Scott Morrison someone who really knows these issues backwards, has been personally very involved in developing a legislative program before the Royal Commission that was aimed at uh, tackling issues around conduct and culture. So the Bayer regime, um, you know, competition issues around, um, you know, putting in place open data. So we've got a, there's a government in place that had already a legislative reform program above and beyond um, the Royal Commission because they'd already started it. And I think you've got a government that is going to be very determined about finalising and, and completing that. So open data is still, um, you know, it's on the books, but it hasn't passed the parliament yet. Um, comprehensive credit reporting. Uh, you know, there's a number of, um, you know, those things that have yet to be done. And I think they will be as keen um, and now as they were at the, you know, before the election to bed that down. Uh, I think having been through what they've been through with banks, I'd be surprised <coughs> if uh, putting the Royal Commission recommendations in place you know, aren't in the kind of top five priorities for the government. Obviously, their election commitments will be there, but I don't think they want to be the government in 18 months' time that um, someone can say, you've gone slow on the Royal Commission and five, you know, 50% of it is, hasn't even been started. So I think we'll see real movement on that. Uh, but I think what, at a much more macro level, I think what you've got is a government that's been re-elected on um, largely... Um, economic issues. Uh, so they'll be watching what's happening in the economy very carefully. Uh, I think banks in that environment can hope that there is room for a more thoughtful and well-informed public discussion as opposed to, you know, sort of firebrand rhetoric about banks. I think it will be easier for the Prime Minister um, uh, with an opposition who's, you know, like all oppositions who... Um, fail to win an election, there'll be a lot of soul searching. And part of that soul searching you've already seen in the public arena is about whether or not some of the you know, class warfare rhetoric served it very well. And a new leader of the opposition who is publicly saying um, he wants to pivot and have a much better working relationship with business generally, um, if that comes to pass, if you've got a more middle of the road Labor Party on these issues, then I think it makes um, the job of the government, particularly in softer economic conditions, um, an easier one in terms of everybody coming back a bit more to the, the sensible middle on banks. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've got away without saying anything about corporate <laughs> tax cuts. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to open up to questions. We've got one here. Now, we have a microphone floating around, so we'll go one here and then Jane over, over the back left there. Yep, I can hear you. No. One, two. There we go. Now, uh, you've... Painted a picture of bank lending to be taking us back to an earlier era, era where you couldn't get a loan from a bank unless you could prove you didn't need it. And we've <laughs> seen the rapid rise of non-bank lending institutions, call them after pay, call them a number of other names, and that would seem to an outside observer something that's going to really expand. What impact does that have in the financial system? Uh, you're absolutely right, and we didn't touch on that. Uh, I think the prospect of growth in competition generally uh, for financial services, um, uh, as well as potentially very big, significant, and potentially kind of unknowable disruption from some very big global players, is looming very large in the minds of all of our banks. Uh, so at the moment, uh, non-bank lending accounts for about 5% of lending, um, but in the last credit data showed it accounted for 12% of the growth in credit. Uh, so that's, I think, a worrying sign. Um, 
partly because well i don't i think it's good that there's competition emerging i think that there's that there are some new banks being approved by apra i think the more we see that kind of competition the better uh you know it's nothing like customers voting with their feet to make sure that any organisation does the best that it possibly can for those customers. Um, but a lot of this sector is very unregulated and the, pros the potential for customer harm is, is certainly there. It's always, I think, a difficult task for regulators in a rapidly changing industry, um, particularly one that's rapidly um, changing digitally. I think it's hard for regulators to always be in front of that. Um, but I think there's, we often, I think, the temptation by incumbents is to say, well, you need to level the playing field by regulating all of them exactly the same way you regulate us. And one of the th conversations we're having is in a in rapidly changing digital environment, um, would you be better off saying, actually, you need to take some of these regulations off? Um, because these organisations are very cleverly using algorithms that... Um, I mean, you know, I don't want to get into a big debate about afterpay, but it, it can't be the commercial success it is without its algorithm actually doing a pretty good job of deciding who it should give credit to and who it shouldn't. Oh, sorry, they don't give credit, but who, who they should allow to use afterpay. So, you know, there's, I think, something to be said for recognising we don't want to solve 2010 problems with 2010 solutions. We want to solve 2020 problems with 2021 and 2030 solutions with open data and comprehensive credit reporting and with the data analytics that are now possible, um, you know, banks are about to be drinking from a fire hydrant of data. And how do we get a regulatory system that allows them to use that data in a way that respects privacy um, and but makes the process you know, faster and more accurate for, for customers? So there's real opportunities. I don't think we want to go into this new era in fear uh, we've got a lot of investment in banks going into some of this work. Um, but they ultimately, you know, if you look at what's happening in China with big payment platforms, uh, you know, Alipay um, and others, it's not ha that hard to imagine, you know, an Amazon or an Apple coming into this market um, and being a very big disruptor. So, and so you're saying right now that you're not going to take the taxi route in response to Uber? You're not going <laughs> to... You know, blockade Collins <laughs> Street, or, or or get out there and, and and you know stop traffic, demanding the government increase regulation on on new platforms. Well, it doesn't seem to have been very successful. And, <laughs> um, you know, the banks banks are not uniform. They they come in all shapes and sizes. They have different customer bases. Some of them do a lot more agri business than others. Others are bigger in small business. Others have much a stronger presence in retail. So they'll all have their own different and. and you know, quite unique challenges. Uh, but I think to the extent that um, Australians do have trust in their banks, one, they trust the security of their banks completely. Um, and we know that because we don't by and large keep our money, you know, in a suitcase under the bed. We actually trust our banks to keep our money secure. And you don't want to lose that trust. And in order to keep it, you need to make sure that all the investment that's happening right now into cyber security, et cetera, is maintained and increased. And I think some of those competitors in the smaller sector are going to find that hard over time. Secondly, we've done research on this. We ask customers, um, we ask Australians, who do you trust to keep your financial, or keep your personal information confidential? And after, um, so uh, Australians trust banks. Um, the only ones that they trust more than banks on their personal data is their doctor and their hospital. So they trust banks more than government, more than um, the big platforms like Facebook. And uh, universities, presumably. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that's important to, to know what you are already trusted for and to hang on to that and make that a, an advantage in a disruptive, competitive environment. Over here. Hi, Anna, good to see you. Uh, what does the fallout of the Royal Commission mean for bank directors and chair people? And it seemed to, again, perpetuate the fallacy that directors and chairs run the bank. We see that again, being replicated. What do you think in particular, given the important role that banks and financial institutions play, it means for banks now going forward? Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, nice to see you here too. Uh, I wouldn't say it is just the Royal Commission. I think it's really important to remember the Royal Commission came out of a period of, I know I keep calling it sort of fever pitch politics about 
and it was a very febrile environment. And it, it, the issues were just sort of almost too, too hot to touch. And government was responding with their legislative reforms. Uh, APRA put out the culture report. There was a whole lot of things that came together all at once. And, um, and the, the Royal Commission, uh, you know, on top of all of that. And I think um, what you're seeing in banks... Um, so, for example, the government put in place the Banking Executive Accountability Regime. That actually imposes um, obligations and accountabilities on directors. Uh, it's still, it still only applies at the moment to the four major banks. From 1 July, it will apply to all banks. Um, and the recommendation of the Royal Commission is that it should, should apply to all, regulated, um, all entities regulated by APRA. So that's going to be a very big part of corporate Australia. I think it's hard to see that sort of thing staying with just the finance sector. I mean, who knows, somewhere down the track. But um, I, I can tell you that anyone who's a board director on a bank is very conscious of what they personally had to sign up for under that legal regime. Uh, I know every bank board is spending a lot of time on reputation. They're spending a lot of time and getting much more granular than they have in the past on complaints. How, are we, When things go wrong, how are we really dealing with it? How quickly are we resolving? Have we got a particular problem with a pro one product? Um, you know, what's actually happening to... How many complaints are going to the external... Um, uh, you know, really getting very granular. I think the thing we'd want to be careful of, not just with banks but corporate Australia, is not getting to a situation where board directors, uh, in order to meet all of the legal requirements and the sort of political pressures, are starting to put their hand far too down, you know, down the throat of the business, and not. I think we do have a system of corporate governance in this in this country that has actually served us very well. And we wouldn't want to, I think, we wouldn't want our board directors to be coming part of an extension of the management team. So that's, that is that is actually live conversations in banks' boards at the moment. Yes, we need to make sure we're across all of these issues that wasn't, there, wasn't that they never looked at complaints, but how much, getting much more granular and really trying to understand what the data is telling them. And that's just one example. Um, yeah, how, how much do we go down and how much do we stay at the strategic level. Up there and then in front. Uh, Anna, thank you. Um, you're very delicate with your answer to last week's interest rate cut for uh, four banks, so well done on that one. But I would like to ask you, um, <coughs> maybe the banks missed an opportunity to actually show that they'd learnt something from the Royal Commission. Two of the banks obviously passed the 25 basis points on. There was commentary with one of the other two banks uh, talking about funding costs and also depositors trying to compensate depositors. But I still feel that the banks, the big four banks, uh, missed a really important opportunity. The second thing I'd like to just comment that's related is customers have a very difficult time to be able to vote with their feet to change banks. If I don't like my mobile phone provider, apart from being in a contract, um, I have number portability we don't have anything like number portability when it comes to home loans. <laughs> so when we hear our politicians say, look, um, if you don't like the interest rate, you know, you just need to exercise your, your rights as a customer, it's very, very pointless. So comments? Uh, I'll take the second one first. Um, and look, I think you're right. Uh, well, again, we've done some research on this and people who have switched recently on their mortgage um, overwhelmingly report that it was easier to do than they thought. And people who haven't switched largely say they don't switch because they, they think it's going to be too hard. So I think there's some work to be done at educating people about... I'm not saying it's as easy as doing a mobile phone, but it is not as hard, I think, as people ha as it once was. I think it will become significantly easier when open banking... So open, just very quickly, you know, it's a consumer data right. Um, it's starting with banks legislatively, um, probably sometime in the next six to nine months, depending on the government's legislative program. And then it will go to um, you know, other utilities, telcos, energy, and it entitles a customer you, for you to walk in um, to you know, the red bank and say, I want you to transfer all of my data to the blue bank. Um, so you don't have to go and get photocopies of your transaction accounts. And, um, and the other bank will have the ability to quickly uh, analyse your data and make an assessment on whether they want to refinance you. Um, I would suggest that when you tell the red bank that you're going to do that, they will say, do you want to talk to us about your interest rate? You know, how can we keep you as a customer? Um, 
So, you know, I, I think that will, will bring some changes. But in terms of number, trans, uh, number portability, I think um, there's been a, quite a lot of discussion about um, a digital ID that you could not only have with banking, but whether banks have um, the ability to be perhaps taking a leadership role in the development of a digital ID that could then be used in government, you know, in your dealings with government, your dealings with other providers. Now, as you know, ID has been an issue in Australia, um, but interestingly, a number of other countries, New Zealand's been doing it for some time now. So I think that that's another conversation about how to make that. Um, uh, look, in relation to the interest rate, I, I you know, I, I'll probably say what I said before in a different way, and that mm. is, you know... Take I, it as a comment like Tony Jones Yeah, does. I think yeah. I'll take it as a comment. I, I, I think, I don't think anyone was unaware of that opportunity. Um, and the decision not to take it, obviously, is one that commercially they made a decision about. Uh, Anna, you rightly pointed out that the um, pressure that the Hain Royal Commission has put on boards, perhaps you're not aware that the APRA regulated boards are in a much worse position than any other boards in the so far as there are very anti-capitalist provisions, for example, uh, uh, a, a significant... Uh, sig significant shareholder is deemed to be non-independent so it's very hard to for these boards to to have a shareholder representative on the board so basically APRA has been trying to rule out capitalism as far as the the banks are concerned and of course they're reaping their reward which is the um, the denigration of these boards which seems to seem to have been incapable of controlling the the anti-customer uh, shareholder actions of many of their executives so uh, would you support uh, changes that would bring back the if not why not provisions to uh, to bank boards at the moment? Those if not why not provisions that, that give some safety to every other board in Australia are denied of the financial system, and this is one of the reasons I think this royal commission had to take place. So I'd be very interested in your views to remove this discrimination against bank boards and against shareholders mm. in general. Whether you might support that. Uh, look, that's a very interesting perspective. I hadn't heard the view that you've just put that the different regulation of the financial sector and the way that that manifests on boards and their obligations or otherwise might have been one of the things that um, underpinned the push ultimately or the, the activity and behaviour that led to a Royal Commission. Um, you've given me some food for thought there. Uh, look, I, I think the question of um, how APRA regulates boards in this sector... Uh, and how the boards of corporate Australia more widely uh, operate. And uh, as I said earlier, Hain has sparked a conversation about that. You know, I know that conversation is happening in the Governance Institute, the AICD, the ASX, um, and I think that's going to continue. Um, whether or not, you know, I'd support what you're proposing, all I can say is I think it's an interesting idea and I'm very happy to go away and think about it. Um, Frankly, right now, I think the priority of banks needs to be and will continue to be uh, you know, implementing the Royal Commission, making the reforms um, that they've put in place themselves, like their code of practice, making it real, driving culture and conduct through every part of their organisation um, and working with the government to get the next round of legislation uh, drafted in a way that best serves the interests of the customer and the community. And don't, I, I just can't underestimate the size of that um, and I'm not saying you wouldn't. We, that, that governance isn't also a piece of that, uh, but frankly, I think we've got to be very clear about what our priorities are right now, and make sure we um, we don't get distracted. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Anna. I'll invite Tom back to um, to wrap up for right. us. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you, Anna. That was terrific. Um, I think there've been since Federation in 1901, there have been several government inquiries into the financial and monetary affairs of the state, and uh, been two Royal Commissions. The first one, I think, was 1936-37, and that and this was obviously in the context of the Great Depression, and that helped set the intellectual and the political scene for uh, nationalising the banks, which of course came to a, a head of steam in the mid to late 1940s uh, during the Chifley Prime Ministership, and it was dead and buried at the 1949 election when Robert Menzies defeated Chifley. We haven't had those kind of recommendations about nationalising the banks with the Hain Royal Commission, uh, but nevertheless, there are very important issues that uh, are, are of uh, public policy importance. And we thank Anna.
and Simon for clarifying all that. So please join me in thanking Anna and Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.